All right, well, I apologize. We're not going to have a pointer again, so I'll just have to point to things. And so this, I, I, you know, is a really depressing sight because this is what Notre Dame looked like before the massive fire almost took it out. And you can see that's the spire that, that you know, collapsed when the roof was on fire. But, you know, the tour boats go on the Seine, and, and Notre, Dame, Notre Dame's actually on an island in the middle of the Seine. And so it's, uh, you know, it was beautiful to see. Let's see if this works. Boy, none of this works. So this thing, even though the green light's on, it has to be plugged in underneath too. So I'm going to put that guy in here. Okay. Sorry, my um, I didn't know that. Eggs. I oh, didn't know that. That's good to know. Uh, let's see if that works. Okay, it works great. And so again, here you can see the. This is the back of Notre Dame again from a, from across the Seine. This is the front, and these are the two towers that, again, thank God they were able to save them because if those gone, the whole thing would have collapsed in on itself and we would have lost it completely. And again, this is the spire that, that fell through the roof when the roof was on fire. This just shows you the side part that's coming on. That's all stained glass. It's be what well, was beautiful. I, you know, they claim they they're going to get it, you know, back up within five years. That's pretty optimistic, but hopefully they'll be able to bring it back to its old grandeur. All right, today we're talking about lens. All right, you're the you're the, the first one sitting there. Tell me about the pathology of the lens. What embryologic layer does it derive from? surface ectoderm derived layer. All right, so you can see on the top how the lens forms. Remember the first lecture we talked about embryology. Much of the, the important parts of the eye come from neuroectoderm. So the neuroectoderm outpouches from the neural tube. It then touches the surface ectoderm, and when it does that, it induces the surface ectoderm to um, invaginate. And so basically the surface ectoderm invaginates, and I like to say it's like you've got a balloon and then someone puts their fist in the balloon. So the surface ectoderm invaginates, and then that little piece of surface ectoderm gets pinched off and becomes the crystalline lens. And so you can see these are chick embryos, but interestingly enough, chick embryos look exactly like human embryos at the same stage of development from four to five weeks of gestation. And this just shows it again in a schematic. Now, once the lens vesicle um, come, pinches off, it's an empty circle. But what happens is, is the lens epithelial cells will grow from the posterior surface anteriorly. And these primary lens fibers come all the way forward. They fill the lens completely, and that's what forms the embryologic lens nucleus. From that time on, there should normally be no lens epithelial cells along the posterior capsule. So that's something pathologic going on if you see those. And so then they go out to the equator, and as the lens grows throughout life, it will grow from those lens epithelial cells at the equator. And this just shows you, this is actually a human embryo, and this just shows you again those cells from the posterior surface coming forward, and those lens fibers then make the embryologic lens nucleus. This just shows you what the nucleus looks like in a normal um, adult eye. So throughout life, what happens is, is those fibers keep growing. So you end up getting a fetal nucleus, eventually an adult nucleus. And then also throughout life, as those fibers keep growing and growing, the lens comes from round to more oval, as we're used to seeing now, you know, the oval shape of the lens. This just shows you in an adult eye. Again, this is the lens bubble where those fibers are the nucleus, the cortex, the lens capsule. And then a schematic. All right, Rachel, what am I showing here and what's the stain? So, um, I think the stain is uh, the sun trichome. Okay, what is it staining now? Look and see what it's staining and then I'll tell you what the stain is. Okay, so, Part of the, the lens capsule. OK, 
okay? And so what stains lens capsule that bright magenta color? This is PAS. So remember, the lens capsule is the thickest basement membrane in the body. And so we always, you know, claim that the eye is the most important part of the body. So the lens capsule is the thickest basement membrane in the body. So anteriorly in the front, you see the lens capsule, you see that lens epithelial cells underlying it. Posteriorly on the bottom, we see the posterior capsule, and you do not see lens epithelial cells. Now, for those of you who are just starting surgery, the posterior capsule is only two-thirds as thick as the anterior capsule. It's five microns thick. So that's all that is there between you and vitreous. So when you have that 40,000 hertz ultrasound in there, be really aware of what it can do to the posterior capsule. What are we looking at right here, Marshall? Um, it's a, we were showing the lens equator with okay. some bowing of the lens. So this is the lens bow. So again, those lens epithelial cells don't extend posteriorly, but you look at them, they're all through there, so they kind of go along the rim of the nucleus. So you think of the lens almost like a flying saucer, those lens epithelial cells go to the, uh, the periphery, and when you're growing, they grow under the capsule, they start laying concentric pieces of capsule, and they send fibers anteriorly and posteriorly. So when the lens is growing, anteriorly and posteriorly, and then they, they tend to meet in the middle, and so you get the lens becomes denser and denser and denser as we grow older. What are we looking at right here, uh, Brad? Um, so this is a zonular fibers attaching to the lens. All right. Now I really want to point out here what's interesting is the zonules attach not exactly at the equator, but they go somewhat anteriorly and somewhat posteriorly. So when you guys are starting to make your capsule orexis, you know, if you take it out to, you know, eight <coughs> millimeters, you'll be getting into the zonules, and so you don't want to do that. But the second thing is you notice the zonules, they insert into the ciliary body, but look at some of these guys. They come clear back here. In fact, some of the zonules almost insert to the pars plane. So we've got a pretty strong, uh, pretty strong insertion there, anchoring the lens in place. Now, what are we seeing here, Ariana? Um, we are looking at the like, sutures where the uh, all these spirals come together. And they form the letter Y. Y. So, and that's because again, it's not a perfect sphere. It's more oval, and so those fibers, as they come around, instead of coming to a single point, they form a Y. And so you've got a Y at the front of the nucleus and at the back of the nucleus. And so you'll see a, a you know, right side up Y and an upside down Y. So again, your mission today, you never even think about this when you're looking at the, the lens nucleus with the slit lamp, find the Y sutures. Okay, so that's your mission. Think about it just for a second and find them because they're there on everybody. And that just shows you how the fibers come together. And this just shows you the lens nucleus here in an H&E stain. It's not really very interesting, and so oftentimes we don't even stain these nuclei. So if you've got a patient with a really hard nucleus and you do an extra capsule or surgery and you send it to us, we, do, we look at it grossly, but microscopically there's really nothing interesting to see. This is interesting because this looks like a honeycomb. These are actually the lens fibers in cross-section, so you see they're hexagonal. And these fibers are interesting because they, they start to lose their nuclei, their nuclei in the cells as they start getting packed in. And they've got lots and lots of proteins in there. And again, their regular array allows light to come through. So it almost looks like a honeycomb in cross-section when you look at the lens fibers. All right, Allie, what do we see in here? Right, so they're wearing an aphic contact, and when you say it's, it's, it's well, actually, sublux, yeah, because sublux means down, but again, it's luxated superiorly, but not only superiorly, but what other direction? Superior temporal. So what entity do you get superior temporal luxation of the nuclei, or the lens? Marfans. So this is a Marfans patient. So I don't know why, but Marfan's go up and out. It doesn't make sense because it's a diffuse zonulopathy, so you'd think that the lens would sink down, but it doesn't in Marfan's. It goes up and out, and I haven't been able to find a good explanation for that yet. So you see the patient's wearing aphakic spectacles. Here's the patient. 
This is a really old picture. This is one of our old texts. This is when the clinic used to be in the main hospital. So this picture is about 30 years old now. But this is a Marfan's patient I took care of for years. Look at his, he's seven foot tall. Look at his long spindly fingers. What's one thing you need to know for boards about Marfan? What, what disease, what entity could kill a Marfan's patient if it's not watched fall closely? Disorders of the aortic root. Exactly. So they get this, this. This is a connective tissue disease, and they can get aortic root dissections. You can get acute, um, you know, failure of your of your valves that are coming out. And so, um, you want to be really careful with Marfan's people. Look at his long, spindly fingers. So this is actually that patient. This is one of the first patients I saw with Marfan's. All right. What do we see in here? Back to you. Yes. Yeah, so. So photographing, uh, <coughs> what's the other one? This looks like it's an uh, inferonasal sublux position. Right, so which entity is inferior nasal usually? It's going to be uh, homocystin urea. Homocystin urea. That's just a board question you really want to know about. So superior temporal is Marfan's, inferior nasal is homocystin urea. Again, I don't know why, but that's what it is. And homocystin urea people can be kind of tall and spindly too, so that really doesn't help you discern them. But again, they're diffuse zonulopathies. They're weaknesses of the zonules that cause this to happen. Rachel, what are we seeing here? It's like you have a more like a cataractous lens, and it's in front of the iris. Yeah, it's in the anterior chamber. So how do you get a dislocated lens in the anterior chamber? What's an etiology that could cause that? Well, also, zonulopathies can, can dislocate in that okay. direction. Too. So this could be a zonulopathy. But in this case, it looks like it's also just like a, a dense round lens. So you could think of something like Weill-Marcusani. Exactly. And so, you know, Weill-Marcusani is, is an entity where you get this small spherical lens. And the people are different than Marfan's because they're not tall, spindly. They're kind of short and have little stubby fingers. It's so kind of short, stubby instead of long and spindly. And so you can get spontaneous dislocation of that small Spherophagical, spherophagical lens in the anterior chamber. What's the most common reason for a lens to get in the anterior chamber? Trauma. trauma. Yeah, so, you know, trauma. Hit to the head, car accident, punched. <coughs> um, and so you can often see trauma as, as the cause of doing that. So you guys know, know the story. Every patient who comes in with, with eye trauma, what happened? Two dudes. Okay, so you, you haven't heard the two dudes story? I was just sitting there minding my own business, and these two dudes just jumped me. They always say, it's never one, it's always two. And I was just minding my own business, and they just jumped me. And so I had a friend from the South. I guess they didn't realize in the South they carried even further. I was on my front porch reading the Bible, and these two dudes jumped me. And so the two dudes can cause a dislocation of a lens into the anterior chamber. All right, and this just shows the path of the lens dislocated in the anterior chamber. All right, now, this is a younger child. What are we seeing on this, this globe that's been cut in half? Marshall. Um, we're seeing that the globe itself looks a little small, and also the, uh, the lens is also more spherical. So what other entity smaller. can you get a small spherical lens in a young child? Congenital rubella. Congenital rubella. This is a good boards question, too. And so when you look at this, what's... Interesting about congenital rubella, when you look at the lens, not only is it small and spherical, but the nuclei tend to be retained more in the fibers. So you'll see nuclei throughout the lens itself, more so than you would normally. All right, what are we seeing right here? Um, we see a cataract right in the center of the lens, and um, looks like it's probably like a congenital cataract, seeing as it's confined to just the uh, center of the lens. Exactly. So you can see that's kind of the fetal embryologic lens nucleus. This is a really interesting one because if you look carefully, here's the female sign, up top is the male sign. So I call this the Prince cataract. Remember when Prince stopped being called Prince the singer and he became this male-female symbol? So this is the Prince cataract. And so you can see it just at least smile or something. This is <laughs> early. Okay, come on. I'm trying to keep these from being too boring for you guys. <laughs> so this, you can see it involves both the central nucleus, not the entire nucleus. So this is a congenital cataract. And here's another one. It's not 
quite as easily seen, but you see the slip beam is coming from the side, and you can see it just involves the central nucleus. So this is a congenital nuclear cataract. Now you can have other congenital cataracts. You can have congenital polar cataracts, anterior and posteriorly, so a whole variety of those. Now what are we seeing right here? Uh, Ariana. This is a liquefied vitreous here and some condensed vitreous there. So this is just showing us kind of a dense adult nucleus. So this is just, just an, an adult nucleus, just a real dense one. And here you see it from behind. It's both nuclear and cortical, but you see the yellowish nuts. And so this is what we think of as our standard adult nuclear sclerotic cataract. It's yellow. We grade it depending on the opacification, depending on the color. So this is your standard <coughs> nuclear cataract, if you will. What is this, Allie? Like a lens, and it's pretty, like the nucleus looks pretty dark. I'd say it's probably brunescent. Yeah, brunescent. It literally means brown-like. And so you go through this progression from yellow to orange to brown to even black. And so it's rare in the, you know, in the developed world that we see, you know, black nuclei like this, but in the developing world, this is not uncommon that you guys will see these. So if you're going on trips with, you know, with our international outreach, you know, you'll often see nuclei like this. And you can see why VACO is going to be difficult on a lens like this, where this would be an ideal patient for a small incision, you know, extracapsular surgery. So this is a dense brunescent nucleus. And you can see now on the pathology, the nucleus here is denser staining than the cortex here. What kind of a uh, cataract are we seeing right here? I guess we're back to you. These look like uh, cortical spokes. All right, so the cortical cataract, it's kind of spoked or pie-shaped. And it'll start in the periphery and then come centrally. And so this one happens to be pretty advanced. So it's kind of an advanced cortical cataract. And then from behind, this is our same picture we had previously, but you can now I want to accentuate here the cortical spokes coming in, in addition to the nuclear. So this is a cortical cataract. And how is cortical different than nuclear when you look at the path? Seems like there's a more amorphous kind of liquid appearance. Exactly. So it kind of liquefies. And hopefully I can show you guys when you're doing surgery with me, when you've got these people with the cortical spokes, oftentimes when I'm doing the rexus, I'll just touch the capsule and you'll see the little bubbles of like be pushed away like little fish eggs. And so you'll get this focal liquefaction of the, cord of the fibers in the cortex. And so there'll be a lot of liquid in here when you get a cortical cataract. Here you can see it again, liquefaction of that cortex. And so that's what gives you the white spoke starting in the periphery and moving to the center. Rachel, what the heck is this? It's like, um, <coughs> Okay, so what kind of cataract is this? It's called a morgagnian cataract. And so when you get end-stage cortical you know, cataract, it'll, the whole thing will turn to liquid. And the nucleus will sink down into that liquefied cortex. And so you'll get it sinking down. And then you'll have the capsule will be kind of wrinkled because the fluid starts to leak out of the capsule. So you'll actually get it shrinking down a little bit. And I always thought this looked like a sunny side up egg. So that's how you remember the uh, Morgagnian cataracts. Looks kind of like a sunny side up egg. <laughs> and this is actually one we did here. Here's the lens capsule with that just not much cortex left, totally liquefied. Here's the dense nucleus in the center. So these are really almost a hypermature type of cataract. So again, you don't see these usually except in, you know, people from Wyoming or something from the ranch, you know like doctors and don't come in right away. What is this, uh, Marshall? Um, here you see a pacification of 
what's most likely the posterior aspect of the lens, so a posterior subcapsular cavity. Exactly, so this is the light shining through, and this, believe it or not, is one of my old fellows. And he said, you know, when he was applying for residence, he said, you might look at my eyes. Someone told me, you know, years ago when I was young that I had a, a cataract. And sure enough, he had a central posterior subcapsular cataract since childhood. So this you can see the beam shining in, and this is right in front of the posterior capsule. So this is a PSC, posterior subcapsular cataract. And there it is against retroillumination. You can see a little bit better against retroillumination. A little bit of a close-up. Again, it almost looks like kind of granulated fish eggs on the inside of the posterior capsule. And there's another one you can see on retroillumination. So, pathologically, what is this characterized by? Um, so you have nuclei on the posterior capsule there. So yeah, what's wrong with this picture then? Uh, it's upside down. It's upside down, exactly. What else happens besides those nuclei extending posteriorly? Uh, you get those, um, this, like the swelling of the cells. What do we call those? Ladder cells. Ladder cells. Or I guess the, the German described them. Vedel. Vedel cells. W-E-D-L. So vedel cells or bladder cells. And so swollen cells, and eventually they can even become fibrotic. So you get this fibrotic plaque on the posterior capsule in a PSC. What are we looking at here, Brad? Um, so this is a picture of the anterior lens capsule, and it looks like we have an anterior capsular cataract. All right, so this is what we call an anterior subcapsular. So these are much less frequent than posterior subcapsular. But what's interesting about these guys is that they are characterized by almost like a fibrous differentiation of these lens epithelial cells. And I don't know if it's a focal trauma that sets these off, or you can even see these congenitally, but what stain is this now? Trichrome. Trichrome. So you see it stains, the trichrome stains like collagenous tissue blue, so instead of the lens here staining the color it should, you see it's got a bluish tint to it, so these lens epithelial cells will undergo a metaplasia, and they will become like fibroblasts, and so they'll start to grow this plaque underneath there, and you'll see the capsule on top of it, so normal cortex underneath it. So this is what we call an anterior subcapsular cataract. All right, what do we see in uh, here, Ariana? Uh, the lens, area, there's a ring of uh, white tissue. Okay, so what, what do we call that? Summering's ring. Summering's ring, and so it's not spelled summer like the season, it's S-O-E-M-M. Um, summer injuring, so he's just the pathologist that described it. And so this can occur um, from two different etiologies. What are the different ways that you can get a summer injury? It can be post-surgical, okay. just from routine cells, but it can be trauma. Exactly. So if you have a trauma and the lens gets ruptured, you can lose a lot of lens content, and the lens epithelial cells that are left in the periphery will grow in this donut. Now, when we started doing extra cap surgery, we would do it manually. You'd manually express the nucleus, and you'd go in there with a handheld, you know, suction cannula, and you'd suck out the cortex, and you had a can opener capsulotomy, so there were irregular edges, so you really couldn't get a lot of the cortical and the lens epithelial cells out of there. So it's not uncommon you'd get a summering drain. Today, you can get it after many, many years, but it's, it's just less frequent that you just see a big summering drain. This is what it looks like. This is an old eye. We've cut it in half. We're sitting at the optic nerve looking out. This is a Mayaki view. And you can see a lens implant in the bag there. And you see this proliferative cortex around the periphery forming this ring. It's like a donut. Is it, is it a separate entity from when you see like the anterior capsule? It gets like really thick. Correct. The anterior okay. capsule, you get the anterior lens epithelial cells undergo a fibrotic change. So you see that the anterior capsule will turn white and you'll get some phimosis. The lens epithelial cells in the fornix are different and they are made to lay cortex. So they'll lay cortex where the anterior capsule are cells that are left over the, at the periphery of the capsular rexus. They're the ones that undergo the fibrous metaplasia. So here you can see now a quote modern surgery. This is a Mayaki eye from you know, 20 years ago as opposed to 30 years ago. 
but you can see this patient had a capsule of Rexus and a three-piece lens in the bag, and you do see a submarine ring, but not as prominent. And here you can see it in cross-section. Cross-section, it looks like a dumbbell. So these two round areas of proliferative cortical material, and the center is, is clear. And this just shows you um, what can happen. Sometimes the anterior capsule and posterior capsule fuse at the edge, and you get this proliferative cortex around it. Um, Allie, bonus points. What stain is this? PAS. Actually, yeah. but PAS, remember, it stains basement membranes and pretty magenta. <coughs> Here it stains it blue. It's trichrome. Trichrome, good. So this is a trichrome stain. And again, look how thick the anterior capsule is as opposed to that thin posterior capsule. So the posterior capsule is only about well, this is exaggeration. This is a rabbit, actually, just to kind of show you guys. But um, the posterior capsule on a rabbit's even thinner. All right, so you get credit for that. So, so. what do we see in right here now? So, this external photograph you see on the periphery of the lens, there's uh, kind of whitish material. And it looks consistent with like a <coughs> pseudo exfoliation. So not only in the periphery, but even in the center here. So this, you know, I guess now we're supposed to say exfoliation syndrome, but again, it's pseudo-exfoliation. And so what happens is, is this material gets deposited on the lens capsule, and then as the pupil moves in and out, it's like a windshield wiper. So it sweeps it out, so you get the little central deposition and the peripheral deposition. It's kind of clear in between where the, where the iris rubs. So here you can see a close-up. This is the so-called scalloped edge look. So you see that this exfoliative material gets deposited in the periphery, and it looks, it looks scalloped when you look at it. Here you can see it nicely on retroillumination. Now, they're not always this prominent. So, you know, exfoliation can be very subtle. Sometimes you see a patient, their pupil just doesn't quite dilate as wide as you think it should. You look really carefully, you'll see some little, you know, white, ruffle stuff right at the pupillary border. So sometimes it's a lot more subtle than this. And what does it look like pathologically? What do we call this? Can you see the material sitting on there? Uh, exfoliative material. Yeah. <laughs> that, no, well, you can actually get by with oral boards on that, but they call it iron filing. And so if you ever take a little sh shreds of iron and you put a magnet on them and they all stand up on the edge of the magnet, so that's what it looks like. These little areas of this exfoliative material just kind of stand up on the edges. And you know what, I'm going to go back. Now, the reason why pseudo-exfoliation, okay, we're going to actually do several reasons. Why does exfoliation syndrome make cataract surgery more difficult? Rachel, give me one reason. Poor dilation. Poor dilation. Marshall? Um, zonular weakening. Zonular weakness. Good. Right. Um, it's uh, when you're doing the capsular rexus, it tends to tear out. Well, not only tear out, but the capsule is more fragile. So it's actually more fragile. Right, boy, we're almost down to, to maybe one other problem with when you do cataract surgery and exfoliation. Build on that. He's telling about anterior capsule, but posterior capsule also more fragile, so our risk of rupture. Well, I guess everything combined. So the small pupil, the weak zonules, the weaker capsule, and maybe one other thing. What else does does this will be another lecture? What other thing does exfoliation cause besides the lens problems? Besides the capsule problems. Pressure, pressure. Pressure. I'm sorry, misunderstood. <laughs> yeah, so it can cause glaucoma. So you've got to be really careful when you do cataract surgery. People with exfoliation, if you um, you know don't watch the, you don't watch them real carefully the first day or so after surgery, they can get a pressure spike. But believe it or not, after cataract surgery, if you just remove the lens and then you've flushed out all that exfoliative material from the you know from the anterior anterior chamber, the pressure actually drops and it can be significant. So you can have a patient with exfoliative glaucoma, you can get a three to five point pressure drop just by removing their cataract. So you've got to be, remember, when you have exfoliation syndrome, 
that they are more susceptible to developing pressure spikes afterward. So, and I don't have enough time in this lecture, but I've got some beautiful EMs that I got from a pathologist in Germany. They actually show the exfoliation material on the lens capsule where the zonules insert to the capsule on the zonular body and where the zonules insert to the ciliary body. So it's like a triple whammy. So if you guys come up to, are they letting you go to the, the ASCRS, the old Crandall course at Deer Valley at the end of the month? Okay, so they, they actually gave me 20 minutes to talk about exfoliation. So if you are going up, you'll be able to see that. What the heck is this now? This looks like uh, you've got some peripheral kind of stain, or not staining material there. Almost looks like a cataractous lens as well inside. And maybe consistent with uh, real exfoliation. Yeah, so this is true exfoliation. So they used to call uh, exfoliation syndrome pseudo exfoliation, you know, to discern from this. You hardly ever see these. This is a case Sam Maskett sent me. This was a woman with no other history. She's like 90, and she had this see that little scroll up there on the top? That's actually a split, a schesis in the anterior lens capsule. And here's the. Um, this is before he's done any capsulotomy. So you can actually see it in the operating room against the red reflex, that little scroll of material. And this case was so cool, he actually sent us the lens capsule, so we wrote it up, and it was on like the cover of the iNet. So we made the iNet cover with this, just because people don't even see this. Historically, what, what kind of you know, job did people with ex true exfoliation do? Yeah, glass blowing. So you remember that you see these pictures of the glass blowers at Molten One, you know, blowing on this and spinning it around <coughs> because it's that intense heat and also the, the infrared radiation that comes out of it. So you actually saw it in people who used to work in these old steel mills before they were automated and they would be like, you know, throwing coke into the, you know, into the blast furnace and they would get these. And so you see that the capsule actually splits. It doesn't go all the way through, but you get a lamellar split, a schesis, if you will. So here you can see the lens capsule. Those lens epithelial cells on the inside, you get this lamellar split on the outside. So this is true exfoliation. And so I've seen one case pathologically and one case in clinic in 32 years. So, I mean, this is <coughs> something you may or may not see in your career, but you have to know it for boards because they love testing minutia on boards. There you can see again beautifully the split, the schesis of the anterior capsule. What's going on here, Rachel? So, uh, it's a pretty angry looking eye, and the cornea is also pretty hazy. You can't tell if there's like something almost like a hypopion or something behind the cornea, and then some whitish area in the pupil. Why is that eye really bad, and why is that cornea looked kind of swollen? Imagine the pressure's uh, considerably up, and if it's due to a lens problem, it could be something like phacolytic glaucoma. Exactly. So this is a patient with phacolytic glaucoma. So again, old rancher, doesn't like doctors, wouldn't come in until the eye started hurting. And so you ask him, well, when did you start to lose vision? Oh, a while ago. And then the wife goes, oh, he hasn't seen out of that eye for like years. And so, you know, you always bring the spouse along to, to you know, tell you the true story. So basically, this is a hyper-mature cataract, and it's so mature that the cortex not only liquefies, but the proteins from the liquefied cortex leak out of the lens capsule into the anterior chamber, and they'll cause a severe glaucoma. So when you look at it, Marshall, what kind of cells are these? Um, macrophages. Macrophages, and if you look at them, they're all that granular, and they've, got, they've been ingesting protein. And so they're just all gobbled up all this protein, like little Pac-Man, you know, rah, 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 and they're gobbling up this protein. And so those fat macrophages clog the meshwork, but so does the protein. And so the treatment for this is remove the lens, wash out the anterior chamber. And so they call it phacolytic. I mean, you don't really lyse the capsule. The capsule's actually intact in these, but it leaks out. And so you get this phacolytic glaucoma. All right, what's going on here, Brad? Um, a 
lot. <laughs> Looks like it's a pretty um, inflamed eye. Um, we've got some, I think that's, is that the lens material left in? All right, so there's some lens material right in here. Yeah. And then coming out of the iris here, it looks like we have a haptic. Yeah, so part half, of the fit, uh, yeah. Half of that eye welds in front of the iris. And so complicated surgery, but this is what we call a phacotoxic uveitis. And so if you leave a lot of lens material, so you have a capsular tear and you can't clean it up real well and didn't do a good vitrectomy, you leave a lot of cortical material in there, plus you don't put the IOL behind the iris. Um, what can happen is, is this leftover cortical material can cause a severe glaucoma. And so again, you get kind of a phacotoxic reaction. And so you'll see these um, referred in, you know, Crandall will get these once in a while where they'll say, oh, we've got this terrible glaucoma, we can't control it. And you look and you see that there's a tremendous amount of this leftover cortical material, which can then incite a lot of inflammation that can lead to a secondary uh, phacotoxic glaucoma. All right, what's going on? You, you did that, Brad. Ariana. On the cornea, there are um, whitish deposits that look that they're uh, endothelial. So okay, what do we call those? These are uh, mutton fat KPs. Mutton fat. So again, I. I guess I not, don't quite know what mutton fat looks like, but I guess it looks like big globs of stuff. And so this is large keratic precipitates. And so they're not just little lymphocytes that are in here. What cells are in these mutton fat KPs? Macrophages. Macrophages are giant cells. And so this is a, and then we looked at uh, the lens itself, and I want to point out, not only did they have an organized hypopion, but look what's going on in the lens capsule here? What is this? What entity is this? I'll give you a hint. It's a double misnomer. This is one of the two double misnomers you need to know. I'm not sure. This is phacoanaphylactic endophthalmitis. So double misnomer. First, anaphylactic means IgE mediated. It's not. And endophthalmitis means infectious. It's not. But what it is is it's a reaction to a very badly done surgery where there's so much cortical material in there that it incites a granulomatous inflammation. Now, these were common, believe it or not, in the 1920s, people were doing crude extra caps, wearing loops and kind of, you know, pulling the, the lens material out manually. And so this was commonly seen. And then as people discovered, if you remove the whole lens with the lens capsule itself, what we call an intracap, there was nothing left in there. So this, this disappeared for several decades. And then in the 70s, we started going back to doing extra caps. And again, we weren't very good at doing it. People were just transitioning to using scopes. You did a canopy capsulotomy. So we actually saw this resurge again. And interestingly enough, this was a case I saw when I was a Dave Apple fellow. And people didn't know what the heck was going on here. And so we wrote it up. And so this was the first phacoanaphylactic endothelitis reported from like 1924 to the early 80s. And so there was this gap in there. People didn't know what it was. And then after we recognized it, we started seeing it a lot. And of course, now it's disappeared again. Because why? We do capsulorexies. We have good microscopes. We've got good you know, IA equipment. We don't leave a huge amount of cortex behind. But remember when I talked the first lecture about inflammatory reactions, we talked about the three different types of granulomas. So this is more the zonal type of granulomatous inflammation where it's actually an, an immune reaction to the lens material that's left over. Now this is another reason you can get phacoanaphylactic endophthalmitis. This poor guy got kicked by a horse. He was trying to push the horse into the trailer and the horse gave him one of these and so he ended up rupturing his lens capsule. So believe it or not, this is what's left of the nucleus. 
and here's some cortex, and he just totally ruptured the lens capsule, and then had a raging um, granulomatous inflammation around it. Here you can see again, here's what's left of the lens material, here's the lens capsule, and ruptured traumatically, and here's a close-up, and if you look right here, there's little macrophages starting to come up inside here to try to munch up that cortical material that's there. And then this is the lens capsule again, macrophages, and you can even get giant cells on this. And so this is called phacoanaphylactic endophthalmitis, double misnomer, not anaphylactic, not an endophthalmitis, but that's what they called this from the 1920s, and again, it sticks. And here we have, well, here's a giant cell sitting right at the edge of the capsule there, munching up that cortical material. All right, we say goodbye to Notre Dame from the river. Any questions on lens? You guys know all there is to know. Okay, next week, is it IOLs or is it glaucoma? I don't know, does anybody have the schedule? Next week is nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Oh, there's no lecture? Two weeks because after Monday, IOL. All right, so two weeks after is IOL. You guys get to chill a little bit because we're going to talk about its history of IOLs. And so the reason we do this is because people are always coming up with new ideas of, why don't we do an IOL like this? And it's, the answer is, well, because we did that 40 years ago and it didn't work. So I just want to give you an appreciation of a little bit about history of IOL, so you'll be able to just kind of sit back and enjoy it. There'll be no reading assignment. All right, great. Thanks. Uh,